Hour 2 Overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. Leafs Vegas tonight, Raptors, Nets tonight, Ryan Callahan coming up here in a moment. That Oilers-Bruins game last night was pretty wild. It was fun. Yeah, it was a fun game. There were fights. There was a ton of goals. It ends up going to overtime. The Bruins that had a big McAvoy lead. boy goal. Like, he's, that guy can dangle, man. He's like a big, tough dude. Plays physical, heavy minutes. But he gets some open opportunities. That guy can handle the, pisc- the biscuit. Yeah, he's a stud. He's he's a, a stud. Stud on, the, on defense. And, you know, Corey Perry got into a fight. That was a typical Perry fight, like, Kind of jostling, then gloves off and starts throwing. And, you know, he's found a role. He's already, like, that story just came and went. And we were talking about that earlier in the week, different stories with the Leafs that have kind of come and went. The the Corey Perry story was wild when it first broke out of Chicago. And now he's just he's just back. He's just playing, and he's speaking to the media after. Well, what was and, wild was the speculation involved. With well, that was of the course. wild part. It went out of hand, and it was ridiculous because no one had any details or facts. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But, but, now but just, the fact that now he was, he's just a guy playing hockey again. No, I understand. But And you're right. That was the bigger thing was the, the obscene speculation. But how often do you see a player of that status just terminated? I don't know. Like, it was a shocking story when it happened. And there was some debate, will we ever see him play again? And not only have we seen him play, he's just back in Edmonton, Canadian market, and just a part of the program out there. But um, that was that was a fun game last night. That was a fun game. And, you know, everyone's trying to figure out, like, what would be the most entertaining cup final? And, you know, you take let's say you take the Leafs out of it because people would accuse us of being you know, well, biased Well, before we that. do that, in this market, it's Toronto-Edmonton. Uh, obviously, Toronto-Edmonton. That's what I was going to Why don't we take Toronto and Edmonton out? Because I think that would be incredible on both sides. To see both teams in a cup final w- would be a, obviously a blast for people in Toronto. For Edmonton, the whole country would explode. Either one, whoever got there, would be, would be massive because you're talking McDavid, the Oilers, you're talking Matthews, the Leafs, their history, all that. You take Edmonton and Toronto out of your options. Mm-hmm. Jonas, do you have any thoughts on this? Like, which would two teams put, would you pick in a cup final? I'd like the Rangers. Maybe Vegas. Rangers and Vegas. I'm doing a rematch That's of not the really Stanley classic. Cup final last year because I think it could happen. Florida and I, Vegas? I think Florida and Vegas could both get back to a cup final. But that's again. Is that what you best want, case, though? though Is it? that what you want? I'm, I'm saying you can, like, I would, I guess what I would, Jonas, I would put Jonas, how Vancouver intriguing in is it to have the same two teams back yeah, in the cup final true. again? Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's, Fair. I'm not just some dope making stuff up. <laughs> You've said like, that twice today. You really I, well, I have to. That. I have to defend myself <laughs> because you have your stupid laugh when I say something. Well, it was Dude. like, I don't think a lot of people had a lot of interest in that final Generally, no. It didn't help that like it's like two of the lower, yeah, markets. Whatever. Yeah, you they're want southern to... markets. Yes. And it didn't help that I, the Heat were in the NBA final. Yeah, I okay, put Vegas take, in my fake. Take final, Edmonton so. and Toronto out of it. What market would get you guys somewhat? Interested? Obviously, Let Vancouver me ask is that. at the top. Oh, How about New York? Guys lost New York. Like, what about a rematch of Vancouver Boston? Would that kind yeah. of that would be wild stuff. And you could say 94 as well, the Rangers in Rangers, Vancouver. Vancouver, yeah. Um, and the, I think that would be maybe number one is Boston, Vancouver, because Brad Marchand's still playing. And the idea of him going in there and trying to punch Pedersen, another Swede in the head, just to see if all hell would break loose like he did with the Sedins, I think Vancouver would be at the top of the list. I'd have to go Winnipeg again because I'd love the idea of, you know, a Canadian team in a cup final. I'd throw Colorado in there. I'd like to see Col- like Colorado... Colorado, New York. Mm-hmm. I want like Makar. Like I like Makar in the final, McKinnon yeah. in the final. But yeah. Jeff is right. Like having multiples. Like remember when the Cavs and Warriors faced off like every year? I kind of liked that. it. Yeah, it but was, that's because of the players involved. That's because LeBron, right. it was LeBron I know, but it Steph. became like kind of a cool thing. It was like, are they going to do it again I this guess, year? Yes, but like in Vegas, is it like you're you're waiting to see it's, Jonathan Marsh so do it again? It's not the same thing, for sure. Yeah, it's nowhere close to like can LeBron overcome something. Curry. With all due respect, or Steph Curry for that matter, but um, all right. Well, we got that's why they play the games. You know, watch it be Philly Dallas Cup Final somehow, and anything is possible. Because again, this time last year, I don't think anyone saw the Florida Panthers in a Cup Final. I mean, they barely made the playoffs. Barely made the playoffs. Exactly. Um, all right, joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline is a longtime NHLer and uh, now current hockey analyst. Here's Ryan Callahan. How you doing, Ryan? 
What's going on, guys? How we doing? Uh, we're doing well, man. We we're just you know talking about, I guess, trying to project where where the playoffs are going to go. We're not even at the trade deadline. We're not even into March at this point. But it it does obviously there are you know prohibitive favorites right now. Probably five or seven teams you can touch on, and two or three in the East, two or three in the West. But um, do you have any like solid read at this point on on how you see it all playing out, or are you buying into the parity theme that really it could be any two teams in the Cup final? Yeah, you know, I think I buy into the parity theme. To be honest with you, you know, I think you have your your cream of the crop where you got a couple of teams that are right there. I think where you, you're predicted. But I just heard you guys as I hopped on, and you were talking about the Florida Panthers of last year, um, you know, clawing their way in, and then obviously making that run. You know, I mean, they were seconds away from their season end in Game Seven against Boston, right? Mm-hmm. And then they end up going on that Cup run. So it's hard to. It's so hard. I mean, that's what makes our playoffs so great, I think, in the NHL and, and so much better than any other sport is uh, not only the battle level and everything else, but truly any team can win going into a series. I mean, you know, I don't like to bring it up, but I was on that Tampa Bay Lightning team that, um, you know, obviously tied the record that year for most regular season wins and lose four straight to Columbus. So it's uh, it's hard to predict, and, you know, I think that's what makes it so exciting, and, and especially the trade deadline coming up as well, right? I mean, who knows what teams are going to look like, um after the deadline, and then also who knows what teams are going to look like going into playoffs with injuries. Injuries and luck play a huge part of it, as you guys know. Callie, I think you had 29 or 30 one year with the Rangers. Probably after that season, you thought as like an American player, you're like, man, I had a pretty good year. Can you put into perspective like what it would be like for Matthew scoring 50 last night and it's not even March? I, sorry, you're cutting out on over on your end as well, or, or just mine, but that's in and out. I heard you say Matthews, but that was about it. Just put into perspective, you had a 30-goal season or close to it with the Rangers one year. Put into perspective a guy getting his 50th before it's March last night, what that must feel like for Matthews. Sorry, boys. You're, you're yeah, okay. Well, on go him on old, Doogie. To, we'll see to... if we can get him back. It's all good. Doogie will get to the bottom of this. That's too bad. That was a good question. But, see, there you go. You got yeah. the Jonas seal of approval. You've got yeah. that a couple times today. I'm not no. asking it again. Uh, it's, <laughs> well, the second time, I could. it is tough to it's read. It's like in the cyclist. Austin Powers movie. You ask it three times and maybe you'll like, get I just, the I yeah. can't bring myself to ask it a third time. I know. Ace, you're going to have to bring him you. in. And, yeah, I'll do it you, for you. You can reform the question. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it for you. Because if I, can... I ask the question and he goes... Pardon me, I can't hear. <laughs> I, I, my head might pop right off my body. Yeah, we've been in the afternoon eight years. We've had a lot of these moments. Is there like a lot of these? You would think somebody lines. in the technical department would get us something that the phone lines would work back there. <laughs> it's not do possible, it's just man. overdrive. Screw it. You need Morgan Forget Freeman it. from the Dark Knight. What is the biggest meltdown something. in the eight-year history of the show? Can oh, you share it on air. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. I, I'm sure there's been many of them. Yeah, there's um, been some closed door meltdowns. <laughs> yeah, there's been a, there's been a few of them over the years, <laughs> a couple off the air ones that uh, you know we were straddling the line, but we always got on. We we always performed, Jonas. There was never any concerns there. All right, we'll see if if Callahan can come back. We don't know what's going on with him, but um, Leafs in Vegas tonight. But it is like uh, to Jeff's point, it is so funny. Like a guy's career year, he's just like it's like nothing to him. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like Tavares is. Tavares had a great career. His career high is 47. Yeah. Right. He just blew past that. Crosby's career high, I believe, is either 50 or 51. 51, I remember I believe. when we were talking about JT right? when yeah. he had that 47. Wasn't that his first year with the yeah. Leafs? We were like, this guy is just so money, and it's like right? 47. But it's through 82 games. Yeah. Yeah. It's just insane. Like I mean, even I was Matthews, talking to somebody right? today at lunch, and they were like, "Isn't the next guy behind him who's having an outrageous year, Ryan? Isn't he ten goals behind?" He's twelve him? back. Reinhardt's twelve back. Yeah, Reinhardt has thirty nine goals, and like I, I think it's a lock he gets to fifty. I think, um, but I think fifty, he will ride his stick down the ice and be like, "I can't believe that!" Like I can't believe yes. I got to fifty, and he may He'll say, go "Nuts!" Like he may, Ovechkin lighting his stick on fire as he celebration. should, as he should, and he likely he might be like, "All right, load management, like whatever we need." I hit fifty. I don't care if I get to fifty one. And meanwhile, you know, Matthews is on a completely different level. We have Ryan Callahan back. You got us, Ryan. I got you, boy. Sorry about that. All right, all good. There. Yeah, all good. We were just talking about Matthews and you know the season he's having. He's got fifty-one, and we're not even into March. Like as a <laughs> as a you know a, a player yourself, as a guy who scored goals yourself, as an American, 
Like, what? How do you? We're all trying to come up with a unique way to describe this. Uh, can you put a unique, you know, perspective on this type of heater that Matthews is on right now? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to describe and you know realize exactly how special and you know how amazing is this run that he's on is is right now. I mean, um, you know, I just did their game in um, their, their last game there in St. Louis. Uh, I guess two two games ago now and. You know, going to that game, he had 48 on the year, and you know, I was looking at it, and you know, one interesting stat that I saw was, you know, 37 of those 48 goals, he had the puck on a stick for one second or less huh. before he scored the goal, and um, you know, that kind of stuck out to me. And you know, he's so good at finding those little holes on the ice, and where defenders aren't. You know, I think his smarts and his hockey awareness isn't talked about enough. You know, to be able to find those spots, knowing that everybody's looking for you and where you're going to be be able to get that shot off that quick as accurate as he does and the velocity that he does is, is really impressive and then obviously playing with a guy like Marner who you know draws double coverage at times because you know rightfully so he's, he's, a, he's a talented player himself and the chemistry they have together um, and then if you look at like goaltending if your puck's on your stick for one second or less before you shoot the puck you know a goaltender's moving to come challenge you they don't have time to set up so even if his shot's not perfectly going where he wants, as that goalie's moving, there are so many holes as the goalie's moving because he's not square to you yet. So I think it's a big part of why he has so much success is finding those holes and being able to get that shot off as quick as he does you know, in those areas. Well, Ryan, you faced him early in his career. Does something look different about him now, like all these years later? Yeah, it, you know, I think he's just – his confidence has grown, right? He, you know, he has almost that little bit of a swagger to him, not that he didn't have it before, but – he knows his own abilities at this point. He knows what he can do on the ice. He knows how special he is. Um, so he almost has a little bit of a swag to his game. And another thing I think people don't chat about enough. I remember playing against him is his size. He's a big, mm. he's a big boy out there. He's, you know what I mean? He's not easy to push around. He's good at getting body position. He's not afraid to go in the corners in front of the net. Um, so you combined all that, you know, with, with his abilities and it just makes it a, a nightmare to defend. And, um, yeah, so I don't know if it's, you know, you can't look at him like, well, his shot's way better because he's always had a good shot, right? And, you know, he's always been a talented player, but I just think being in the league is a little bit more of a swagger and he, he knows how much he can dominate and he's doing it. Callie, you, were, you played a long time and John Tavares is now playing a different role. Like, did you experience that where it's like you go from a guy that's on the PP to doing different things? Like, what's that transition like as a player where you either just recognize that or you're told that? Yeah, it's not, it's not easy. Uh, I'll tell you that. I, and, and I dealt with that in Tampa my last couple of years there. Um, you know, and as you said, you know, I was always net front power play one for a long time. And then, um, you know, as I got older and, you know, you look back at now, you realize my feet, foot speed probably did slow down a little bit and, and everything else a little bit slower. But at the time, you're, that's tough to accept, right? You, you want to be out there in those critical moments. You want to be the go-to guy. And I think Tavares has done an unbelievable job at, at being a pro with it and realizing that his role has changed and he's embraced it. Um, you know, he, maybe he's not, he doesn't get the minutes he used to. He's been, you know, not out there all the time like he, he used to be, but he, he's still effective. He's still putting up points. Um, you would never guess that if it, if it did bother him, it, you would never see it, right? You know, he never carries that in his face or his demeanor. Um, you know, he, everybody talks about it, but he's a, he's a consummate pro, right? He, he knows his role, he knows his job, and he goes out there and he does it. And, you know, he's a big part of their success, obviously, being a leader on that team. But it's not easy. I mean, I, I went through it, and, and I struggled with it because I, you know, no matter – and you, you, you know, too, Odak, like, you, you, no matter how late you are in your career, you still think you could still play like you were when you were, you know, in your early 20s in your prime. Like, you still have yeah. that belief in yourself. There's a little part of you, Cali, where it just seems like you're getting screwed. Like, it's just like – Yeah, oh, man, 100%, I'm 100% it is. Right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Coach is screwing me here. Like, That's oh, exactly I right. do it. <laughs> You know, and, and to Tavares' credit, he, you, you don't see that at least. You know what I mean? I'm sure he thinks it at times. It's human nature, but you don't see it on the ice, and, and I'm sure you don't see it in the room either with him. With Ryan Callahan, the Leafs are in Vegas tonight, and they're dealing with injuries. Mark Stone's out. Jack Eichel's out. They've had injury issues all year. Um, but, you know, presuming health, everyone's back, and they're ready to rock come playoff time. Where, where does Vegas rank for you in the West? Yeah, they're, I mean, they're right up there. Um you know, one of the favorites for sure. Obviously, uh, you look at the West, you know, I look at Edmonton, Colorado, um, or up there that run Edmonton's on or was on, currently on, is is very impressive. And we all know the firepower they have there. Um, but if Vegas is healthy or, 
and even who knows, you know, the old the people like to call it the old Kucherov rule. Mm-hmm. Who knows what happens here with their yeah, <laughs> their, oh, yeah. That cap space they have now. So that team could look a little different as well. And we all know they're not afraid to go out and make a big trade, right? So it's uh, that could get interesting there. But yeah, Vegas is is right there again. I mean, it's going to have to go through them. I think um, if everybody's healthy there, or seeing what they do at the deadline. Yeah, I mean, we're all we're all wondering what's going to happen here, and you look at all these trade bait boards, and you know, there's good players, but not like massively impactful players. Like, are you bracing for activity here, Ryan, or do you think it's going to be you know relatively quiet? And you know, obviously, there's going to be moves, and good players are going to go. Hanovan's a good player, Tanov's a good player, Gensel's yep. a really good player. But is this maybe a year where? You know, you kind of got to have your your ducks in in order before you even get there. Like, if you're banking on the trade deadline to push you over the top, uh, I'm not sure that's the right philosophy because I'm not sure you can fulfill that prophecy uh, based on what players appear to be available at this point. Yeah, I don't think that's probably ever the philosophy, even mm-hmm. when there are good players available, right? I mean, getting a good player in or even a stud in, who knows how that's going to work out for you. You could ask the New York Rangers about that last year, right? Um, yep. you know, who, who knows how that message, match it, how they mesh with the team, trying to get used to the squad. I mean, I got traded right at the deadline to Tampa and I didn't feel comfortable there until the following year. Once I went through a training camp and, you know, I knew the team, I knew the city, it, it all comes at you so fast. But as you talk about the trade deadline in general, I mean, I think the biggest thing out there is, as you look, I think there's, and you mentioned them, those D men, right? Can you get some good depth D, which I think is huge come playoff time is those depth D. You know, you look at Colorado the year they won, and they brought in um, Josh Manson. I love mm-hmm. that deal. You know, and, and I know you guys cover Toronto well. Like, I think that's that's something they need, right? Is somebody like that. And I remember that year, me and Kevin Weeks were talking, and we were we were talking about Manson. We're like, man, he'd be good on the Leafs. Like, you know, if they could figure out a way, Colorado ended up picking him up. But you know, I think if Toronto can add some depth to their D, obviously they've had a lot of injuries on their D right now, but. Um, you know, I think that's a key piece for them. If, if they can find that, you know, they went pretty heavy on their forward trades last year. Um, but that, you know, when I look at them, I think they need to add a D like that. Maybe some, grab somebody out of Calgary if they can. Well, Ryan, you mentioned your own trade deadline experience. What would advice maybe would you give for someone getting traded for the first time? Like you mentioned your own experience. I talked to Jake McCabe the other day and he said he didn't start really feeling comfortable until this year. What, what advice would you give for someone who's never been traded, who gets moved at the deadline? Uh, <laughs> that's tough. Um, you know, be prepared for a whirlwind because that was the first time I was ever traded too, even from junior hockey, right? I, I didn't even get, I was playing Guelph and I never got dealt out of there. So that was my first time ever being traded. And it just, it, it happens fast. And, you know, I, it's not the stuff on the ice. You, I mean, you've played hockey your whole life, right? So you, when you're on the ice, you're comfortable. It's the stuff away from the rink, you know, dealing with family coming down, trying to place to stay, getting used to a new city. Um, you know, getting used to new teammates off of the ice, things like that, that are, that are so hard. Um, you know, so you're trying to deal with all that. And, you know, usually the place you're coming from, everything's settled. You just, you're only focused on that is hockey. Like that's all you're worried about when you leave the rink or when you're at the rink is, you know, playing the game. So it comes at you quick. I don't know. You know, I, even going through it, I don't know if there's one thing I'd say, like, you know, make sure you do this. It's going to make it a lot easier. It, it, it's just, you got to have the right mindset. And, um, I think the biggest thing on the ice, though, probably is just try not to do too much. You know, in my case, I got traded for uh, Marty St. Louis, and, you know, I remember being like, you know, I'm never going to fill this guy's shoes. Like, Mm. you know, so, but Iserman and and Cooper talked to me. They're like, listen, we we don't want to do anything like St. Louis. We know, you know, like, no disrespect for you. You're not going to put up the points he put up. You know, just play your game. There's a reason why we traded for you. And that settled me down on the ice, you know, and then I'm like, okay, like, you know, just go out there and play the way I've always played and see what happens. But it, uh, it comes at you quick. So I know I love talking about it now I'm in the media, but I don't uh, envy the guys that have to move. <laughs> yeah, well, there's going to be a number of them between now and, and March 8th. There's no doubt about that. Um, it's going to be a fun night in the NHL. Enjoy it tonight, Ryan. We appreciate you doing this. Awesome, guys. Thanks for having me. There's uh, Ryan Callahan, ESPN hockey analyst, joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline. Check out Maple Toyota's huge truck and SUV lineup, including Tundra, Forerunner, Highlander, and Grand Highlander in stock and ready to deliver. Visit mapletoyota.com. If I was ever traded at the deadline, I would just focus on having a good time. <laughs> that would be your focal point? What would that it look would like? Be. Mm-hmm. I would not focus on bringing the fam jam, like moving trucks and all that. I'm just going to set up shop in a nice Ritz-Carlton yeah. and nice dinners out and find nice 
like cocktail bars and just have a good time and i'm going to enjoy the experience i like that Actually, a little vacation hopefully, the, <laughs> a little hopefully vacation. there's a long run and <laughs> no it's not it's not a working it's it's a working vacation i see you just have a nice time that's okay. all i'm saying do you appreciate I had plenty that? Of I guys, love that. <laughs> I had a lot of guys traded to Hartford. They knew it wasn't going to be a long-term thing. They just had a nice time. <laughs> but I ended up joining them for their nice time. Right. So I was constantly having a nice time. It was a nice time for everybody. Yeah. And that's, I just, I've that's heard how that's, you build teams. I've heard that so much that it takes so long to get comfortable. And I, I know I don't, just, I don't take that into account enough. Like I remember, Dude, Jake Muzzin told yeah. me it took him three months before he felt like kind of okay. Yeah, it's got to uh, be awkward when man. you're in a locker room and everyone's got like inside. I remember my first yeah. physical with the Leafs. It's like everyone's doing their inside jokes and their stupid laughs and their comments, and it takes you a while to get inside the loop where you're like, "Oh, that's what he's talking about. That's actually kind of funny. That guy's not a moron," and yeah. it takes a while. I don't think it takes three months though. If you got a good personality and you're in the mix and you're a good player, yeah, but get like, involved. Get it, involved and have a good time. <laughs> have a good time. Have I a like good this. time. I just know, like, just from talking to McCabe, like he said, like I'm more of a quiet guy, and so it took me some time to do exactly what you're talking about, Jeff, to feel comfortable in the room. Not everybody is like that, right? Not everybody is outgoing. Not mm -hmm. everybody is like you. Well, I mean, I I think you look back at what happened with Boston last year. Ultimately, what happened is Sergei Bobrovsky just became a mutant, a monster, a monster in net, and then Verhage and Kachuk, and things broke their way. But I do wonder if they have buyer's remorse at all. Not that they didn't acquire good players. Like Orlov was a really good player. Bertuzzi was great for them. Hathaway. Um, Hathaway. They brought in a number of guys, yet they were already on pace for like the greatest season ever. And do they look back on it and wonder now, like, did we mess with anything? Like, again, I think there's a reasonable explanation. Bobrovsky was, was Like, they freakish. messed too much? But it, exactly. Like, you lost in the first round. And as much as, let's say 95% of it was, you just got to give credit where credit's due. The Panthers did what they were supposed to do. There was an element of choking from Boston's side. It's a choke. You're up 3-1. Uh, you got multiple games at home. You got to close that series out. But could it have also been, why, why'd you add so many guys yeah. when we were already rocking? You just can't help yourself. It's greed. Yeah. You're like, you want to push it over the top and, and actually do this thing and win this thing and reward the guys for mm -hmm. what they've done. Yeah. But maybe retrospective analysis, looking back on it, it's like, maybe they just needed Orloff. Yeah, exactly. Maybe they just needed Bertuzzi. Right. Maybe it was one or the other. Just pick one where you're like, we're not going to screw too much and defensemen go down all the time in the playoffs, so we'll get Orloff as a backup plan if somebody goes down. Mm. And maybe that would have been an... Who knows, man? It's just yeah, I mean, second-guessing uh, everything. Of course. But, you know, again, the Leafs last year, they got to the second round, but they, they turned over a third of their roster. Mm. Like, they brought in six players and, again, I, it worked in terms of Tampa... But it didn't work against Florida, and every year is different. Every every acquisition is going to have a different impact, of course, because I understand in Vegas they're going to say Barbashev was huge, which he was. He was a massive acquisition. Um, but but there is like to your point, there's a trickle down effect. Like you acquire Bertuzzi, and now suddenly Bertuzzi is taking player X's minutes, and now mm -hmm. that guy's playing less, and then that guy's playing minutes ahead of somebody else, and suddenly like your room is a little different, your exactly. dynamics are different, roles are different. Guys' noses are out of joint. It's right? Like, oh, really? This guy just showed up? Okay, he's playing there? That's interesting. We haven't lost in uh, three weeks, but okay, I'll move down the lineup. You know, like that, uh, that's... Or a popular guy gets moved for the asset right. coming in where you're like, uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this is all the dynamic of, you know, being a manager and putting the puzzle together. Exactly. You make and three and a half million bucks as a GM or whatever the hell you make, you got to figure you that gotta out figure what's that going to work. That's your, that's your, this is when you got to shine. Like, the, and, and you got to make the right moves. And it may be not actually making a move or getting a player that might have a different you know, talent level, but he fits in better or more seamlessly yeah. or won't affect different guys you don't want to mess with. Um, and those are all the complicating factors that go into this. It's not just as simple as, well, just go all in and get all those guys. Like, that's not the way it works. You know, because I've heard that thrown around a lot, and I just, it, that's an well, empty calorie statement. Like, just, you got to go all in. What does that mean? 
What is it? What is go yeah. all in? Yeah, go I all in. That. Your team should be formulated or put together in a situation where, like the Florida Panthers, they don't need to add a whole lot. Right, but they don't again, need to go and get a Claude Giroux from Philadelphia this year. Mm-hmm. They don't need it. Yeah, I agree with that. And again, I, I can make sense of each individual move. I guess what sure. I'm talking about is the process. But like the the bold and the bold statement of go all in would suggest like you never have a limit on where you're willing to stop. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it's Buddy, okay. Catholic, Eastern Conference that guy done. Going all in means different things for. Edmonton Oilers all in. What the hell does that mean for them with their money white right now? Well, that's another thing. Like uh, guy, the cap situation is going to factor in. The Leafs have some some space. Mm-hmm. You know, not a ton. They but could they, create more if they wanted to. And they could create more. They could move pieces out. They could sure. move pieces around. They can get creative. They have enough. Like they have the ability to do a number of things. Yeah. Uh, and and I'm not sitting here predicting what they're going to do. I think everything is is on the table. We'll find out as of March 8th. I think all of it is a possibility. I, I fully expect them to make moves. It's just, is it more of a depth tinkering move or is it a big splash? Like, is it Hannafin? Is it Tanev? That's going to cost a fair amount. And that's a big move. Like, that's a big chess piece you're bringing in and would undoubtedly help this team and and improve the team. I don't really understand how they can get Tanev if they don't want to give up their first. What what do they trade? Well, and you don't want to give up your top prospects. It's like, well, you don't have a second. mm -hmm. I think Calgary can do better than a third. What are you trading? Like, I don't... That's the question. That's one like, of the things I've been thinking about. It's like, well, you don't want to trade your first. I get that. I don't think I would want to trade There's only so many first. options, Jonas. Right? Like, yeah, there's only so many options. It's one or the other. Or well, right? Like, Calgary's other. like, okay, you don't want to trade your first, and you don't want to trade your prospects. Okay, peace. We'll find... Well, obviously, team. yeah. Like, uh, they, And they will find somebody else. Right? Now, I, I would assume no one's willing to put a first on the, on the line, or Tanev would have been traded by now. Like, I would guess. That's fair, but they could probably get a second. Yes, yeah, so I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I guess I wonder if the Leafs are contemplating like, do we put Nick Robertson in? Is that it would is Calgary, that enough? I don't know. I don't know. Calgary may not be interested in that, but I would think a guy who's playing that's been primed a little bit older. If they're trying to retool, Nick Robertson would be more valuable than a second round pick. Yeah, that's fair. He was you know? a second round pick. Yeah, no, exactly. But he's also three, four years yeah, into his right. professional career. Now they the scouts may not like him, or they may not feel like he's going to develop. So that may not be the best example, but. Um, you know, they're, they're, maybe it's Timothy Lilligren is going the other way. And it's different, a package where, again, Lilligren's going. They got him under control. He's a good young defenseman. Tanev and something else is coming back the other way. They might have to get creative that way. Where do you guys stand on him? Because, like, there's, I'm kind of with you in that I'm still a little, like, unsure. But we've also seen, like, teams trade away defensemen too soon and come to regret it, including here. Mm-hmm. Do you, like, he's, he's 24. He'll be 25, I think, in April. He still hasn't played 200 NHL games. You see games and like stretches like this, like the last little bit where you're like, huh, something interesting here. Mm-hmm. And yet you also see the stuff that you don't really like as much. Like, do you buy the stock? Do you, are you still Can in? Or you like, yeah. yeah. I think on a cup contender, he's a guy that's coming in and out of the lineup, to be quite honest with you. Yeah. I, but like, what I about agree. like his trajectory beyond this year? I, think, I don't think it's any higher it's than the what it is right now. Yeah. I think in the regular season, he's a player. Like in a 32-team league, he's he's for absolutely sure. a top no six doubt. in the NHL, and will probably be in the league for a number of years. But do you think like what but, will ha- do you think? Can you see a scenario where like with Anton Strawman, mm-hmm. where they trade him, he goes on to New York, he grows in New York, he becomes like a really important part in New York. Then he goes to Tampa, and he's even more important in Tampa. And it's like uh, it's I mean, not it's, the same. That's out thing there with exactly. any transaction. If he were to move on, that that that's always out there when a guy moves on where they find something magically in the future right. and they turn into a player. That risk is there with every transaction when somebody goes out that door, especially at a young age. And I'm not saying they're moving him or thinking of moving him. Right. I just don't see any type of ceiling that he brings to the table from what I've seen. And there's been some nights I really liked what he's seen. Puck carrying ability, his shot, his ability to make plays. But I don't know how much better it's getting than it is right now for him. Well, and also Lilligren's played a lot more than where Strawman was like when he was here, like Strawman was not a guy they were playing yeah. into the ground. He was ground like, for a, no years. thanks, go play somewhere else. Right. Yeah. And I think it was Ron Wilson didn't like him or didn't see a fit and they moved on him. And obviously, to your point, he became a really integral piece and a really good player. Uh, Lilligren has had a ample opportunity the last, I'd say, three years to play. Fair. Like he has played. Yeah. So I, I would like to believe 
an NHL read on him is more accurate than a guy like Stroman. But it's like but that's that thing with the, the games, right? Like, yeah, yeah, he still hasn't scare. played a ton of games. I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. And again, I I think that's a question that I'm sure they're they're throwing around right now. Because like, what else? You don't have a ton to trade, and so like, he would be one of the people I would be like, well, yeah, maybe. I think they're contemplating like a Lilligren thing, a, a Robertson thing. You know, the first round pick, other prospects. You know, all of that I'm sure is on the table. And why would it not be until you make a decision as of March 8th? But they might also be waiting to see if another team decides between now and the 8th to say, you know what, we're selling. And yeah. as of now, maybe they're not a part of that conversation, but they will be in the next week and a half. Yeah. Right? Lose a few games, realize it's not their year. All of a sudden, a guy comes up where it's like, all right, he's got two or three years left on his deal. Then it's the first. I love this then waiting until a couple more weeks to see what you got. Like, I know. But it happens. The old, the old American Thanksgiving is just punted right out the window it's like well like kyle's been saying it for three months and pit it's like mm -hmm. yeah the next little stretch is going to be very important so to see where we're at yeah how many times do you need to see the same segment well two and five and we we're not good enough to win in a bunch of different areas and it, then the next segment two and five well you know give them a couple more weeks yeah they'd have you. to go on quite a heater to change anybody's opinion on that i hear you all right, Leafs Golden Knights tonight. Little panel night. You guys doing a quiz tonight? Absolutely. Yeah. Is there an Austin Matthews goal scoring quiz question that you're aware of? I'm not aware of that. Okay. I bet you if I were to guess, though, with the tear he's on, it would be maybe multiple. Ooh, very interesting. All right. I look forward to that tonight. Say hi to everyone for us, and we'll catch you tomorrow at 4 p.m. We'll chat then. And once again, Hazy, it's been a great eight years. I love working with you every day, bud. You too, pal. There he is. The O-Dog, Jeff O'Neill. Eight years in the afternoon on Overdrive. Jonas, you're here for the big celebration. It's very nice. Eight years is not a big, real, yeah, it like, is. it's not what, a milestone. What do you but, get each other for eight years? A uh, little handshake last night and a cup of coffee. We had a good time, right? We had a good time. I think the three of you need to go out for like a steak dinner. All right. We might do that. Have a good Jonas time. Be back we'll have, yeah, a, have, have a good, good time. time. <laughs> Pretend we got traded and we're just. 